Well, the story I'm about to tell about an avalanche happened uh, March 7, 1978, a long time ago. Um, I was head of the uh, Whistler Mountain Ski Patrol at the time, and uh, we'd had a considerable amount of snow over the last couple of days, and uh, uh, we were going to go out for uh, avalanche uh, control uh, routine. In the meantime, a couple of uh, ski patrollers from the uh, Snowbird uh, ski area in Utah had, or had come up to Whistler uh, on an exchange. Uh, there was Rick Mandel and another fellow named Eric Ryberg. And Things were a little different on Whistler back in those days. The peak chair didn't exist. Uh, the lift that went to uh, that went the highest was the T bars in the uh, T bar bowl. And to get to the top of the shell slope <coughs> where we had to go, there was the high traverse. And you went started out at the top of the, of the T bars and traversed as high as you could, pretty much to get to, it was a high stepping traverse to get to the top of the shell slope. But for avalanche control, uh, there was the uh, lower slope of Surprise, uh, which was a regular performer. And to clear the way for the group going on this uh, avalanche route, there was a gun at the top of, uh, uh, near the top of the T-bar. Uh, we called it Gun 2. Uh, the shack is still there, um, but the gun is long gone. But uh, this was an avalanche gun, um, the kind that would shoot out a kilogram of, kilogram of high explosives using compressed nitrogen uh, to fire it out. It wasn't the most accurate thing in the world, but it served a purpose. Uh, but <clears throat> before the team went across to the... Uh, top of the show slope, the team on the gun would have to, first of all, they'd shoot into uh, the Harmony Ball and clear, clear uh, uh, Harmony Horseshoe and the kaleidoscope, and then they'd swing around and shoot uh, uh, north face high and uh, the other north face, and then also clear Little Whistler. Um, on this particular day, uh, the gun was up, the guys in the gun were up there. I think there was Chris Stetham and Cal Fenwick, and they were shooting rounds, but the visibility kind of deteriorated on them. And I'm not quite sure what happened, but somehow the shot uh, didn't get into North Face High. So when the bunch of us were hiking across to uh, put shots into Surprise and into uh, the Shell Slope, and to operate gun three, which is an avalanche gun that was at the top of the shell slope at the time and used to shoot into uh, Whistler Bowl. Um, I was a little nervous because we'd had enough snow and uh, I wasn't sure that a shot had gotten into North Face. So I told the, the other guys to hang on, don't come across uh, until <coughs> uh, Crookshank and I had uh, thrown shots into the surprise area and then to come across really well spaced out. Uh, so Ian and I, Ian Crookshank, who's still on the ski patrol, um, went to surprise. He was on uh, one side, I went across to the other side and we both threw our charges in. We tried to throw them in so that they go off simultaneously, but it never quite worked. But whatever, the shots did go off, and uh, the report coming from uh, the guys in the gun where we got a pretty good slide out of surprise, but North Face High didn't go. And that made me rather nervous, so I called Ian on radio to come over to where I was, and I could see a kind of, uh, it was either a ridge or a lateral moraine 
uh, that looked like it would be safe if we stood there if an avalanche did come down uh, North Face High. And then I radioed to the guys to, uh, they could come up, but um, <clears throat> maintain good separation. So they started on their way up. Uh, Schneidly Whiplash uh, was leading, and he, he set a higher than normal traverse, which was probably not a good idea, but he did. And he was a senior patroller, so uh, I wasn't going to say anything to him. And uh, so they came up, and a couple of the guys had already passed what I figured was the danger area. And all of a sudden, there was a roar, and there was an avalanche coming down. And as I looked up, I could see that Bruce Watt was going to get caught. And I looked the other way, and I could see Rick Mondell was going to get caught. Um, Bruce got caught. He got tumbled around. But when he came to when the, the avalanche stopped where he was, he had one hand sticking out. So I figured, OK, the guys are going to get him out. And I watched Rick. And uh, he was yelling, and he was heading straight downhill, uh, yelling avalanche. And a slide came and knocked him knocked him over, knocked him face down, um, buried him a little bit, and then the second wave came and buried him deeply, severely. Uh, I yelled at the guys up above to get Bruce out of there as fast as they can, and I <clears throat> got my transceiver out. In those days, we were, we were using a Peeps 1, and you had to pull the earpiece out and stick it in your ear and get the thing going. Um, Meanwhile, I radioed in saying that we'd had an avalanche and that Bruce, would, that Bruce had been buried and, and uh, Rick Mandela had been buried and I was going to do a transceiver search. The radio went crazy, so I turned it off because I knew I couldn't both pay attention to the radio and pay attention to my transceiver. And I started in, and in those days there were pure analog transceivers and you just worked off the noise and you went along in a straight line and slowly turned the thing down until you found out where you should turn one way or the other. Um, and I knew I had to turn uphill because I knew where, somewhat where Rick had been buried. And uh, followed up and he and Crookshank, had, he had his transceiver out, but he didn't look like he was quite on track. So I went, I think this is up to me to find this guy. And I followed and, and uh, got to where I thought I was pretty good iron close and did a pinpoint and was working on finding the exact location. Meanwhile, Bruce, who'd been pulled out of the snow and had lost a ski, had managed to get himself down to where I was. And along with a couple of the other patrollers, they came in and uh, as I pinpointed and I thought I had the area pretty well spotted, and, I looked at Bruce, and he skied on a pair of 215 skis in those days. We didn't have any pros with us. I said, Bruce, push your ski down and see if you can find the guy. And so Bruce grabbed his long ski of his and pushed down and said, I got him. So, OK, well, let's dig. But we didn't carry shovels in those days. And that wasn't something the ski patrols were used to doing. So we just started digging with our hands, and we dug and we dug. And you will, people will tell you that avalanche uh, snow sets up like concrete. It does, but it takes time. It's, a, it's called age hardening, and it takes time for that to happen. The fresh snow that, it came, that came down in this avalanche, it was a soft snow avalanche, was still pretty soft and pretty easy to dig. So we dug like a bunch of dogs, just pulling the snow out and pulling the snow out and digging and digging, and then we finally got down uh, to where we got to where uh, Rick was, and we could tell that he was face down with his head downhill, and we dug till we got to his head and dug around in his head, and Bruce has these long arms. Bruce is about six foot five, and uh, I said, Bruce, get your hand in there and see if you can dig the snow out of his mouth. I was sure that Rick had snow in his mouth because he'd been yelling when the avalanche caught up to him. And so Bruce got his down, his arm down there and got his fingers into uh, Rick's mouth and dug the snow up. In the meantime, we could see it, the back of Bruce's, of uh, Rick's neck was blue, which meant he was quite hypoxic and hadn't been breathing for a while. But as, as Bruce got the snow out of his mouth and dug more snow out of his mouth and pretty much cleared it, 
suddenly the glue on Rick's neck started to be started to go away and the back of his neck started to turn pink. And we thought, I think we've got him. I think we've got him. And I radioed to the Alpine office, turned my radio on again, and radioed to the Alpine office and said, I think we got him. He looks like he's okay. Um, <clears throat> turned out that uh, Rick had been buried for seven minutes by the Alpine office timing. In the meantime, uh, the guys had left from uh, the ski patrol shack at the top of the uh, red chair. They grabbed the, the probes and the big shovels, and uh, fairly soon they were uh, at where Rick was buried. And so we were using the, we had big grain shovels in those days, and they were for this kind of work, and they were actually too big. You'd lift it, and you could carry too much snow. It was really hard work. So we just sort of passed the shovels around, and we dug, and we dug, and we dug. It took us 20 minutes to uh, actually clear right down to Rick so that he could finally get out of the hole. Uh, he had his ski still on and he had both poles still on. And so we had to dig down and clear his skis. We had to dig down and clear his poles so that we could get him out of there. In the meanwhile, uh, Dr. Jeff Boyd, who was a ski patroller, had arrived. And uh, he was doing his best to check Rick out and make sure he was okay and check Bruce out who seemed to be really good because he was full of energy and found Rick with his ski. And uh, so we finally got uh, Rick dug out and we sent both Rick and Bruce to the clinic. Turned out they were fine and uh, they were Rick said later, he said, after he got buried, he could feel that he was passing out. He knew that he had a transceiver on. He was wearing a skatey, which was the original American transceiver. Uh, we all had the peeps, which were uh, Austrian transceiver. Um, but they were compatible. They all worked at 2275 hertz. And so we knew they were on compatible frequencies. And Rick said, I know I had my skatey going, but I passed out. I wasn't sure whether I was going to come back or not. But he said it was pretty amazing when I did come back and realized I was going to be okay. So this story got into the local Whistler question of the day, made headline news. There it is. Ski Patrol buried in Avalanche, and uh, this was a big deal in the valley in those days. And uh, it was a, it became a very well-known incident, both in uh, Whistler and in Snowbird. When Rick got back to Snowbird, they started calling him the Blue Boy. It was a nickname, I'm not sure he appreciated it, but it was a nickname that uh, apparently stuck for the rest of his career. And recently, um, Bruce Watt told me about a, this book. It's called Avalanche Busters, a historical memoir of the Snowbird and Alta Ski Patrols. Um, the book actually belongs to Roger McCarthy, Rick told me, or uh, Bruce told me about it, because in this book, the whole incident with Rick Mandel and Whistler uh, is described. And at the end of the description, uh, the author, a uh, gal named Linda Bonner, says, um, later, Mandel learned his rescue set a new record. It was the first documented avalanche rescue in which rescuers used a PEEPS, a European-made device, to find a victim wearing a skatey. Now, it's a very ambiguous kind of sentence. I don't know whether she's really referring, whether she's saying, well, this is the first time a PEEPS had found a skatey, or whether she was saying this is the first time uh, a, that a live rescue had been performed with a transceiver. Uh, I'm trying to find that out. Uh, 
but this was obviously a self-published book, so I can't contact the publishers, and I can't find, so far I haven't been able to find uh, any uh, way of contacting uh, the author of the book. Um, but I'll, I'll work, I'm working on it. <laughs> I don't really know. I'm not making any claim to have done any kind of first, because I'm not really sure whether it's true or not. <laughs> maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but I'm not making a claim. The only claim I'm making is that I did find uh, Rick using my Peeps trans transceiver, uh, and it located Rick, who was wearing his skatey transceiver. 